All right, good morning, children. This is your favorite Sunday school teacher, K. Edward Copeland, coming to you through the facilities of New Zion Missionary Baptist Church here in Rockford, Illinois. Today is the day that the Lord has made. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it. I'm grateful to God for another beautiful day. And for those of you who will be watching this, not live, but perhaps uh, later on in the day or on another uh, platform, as always, we want you to check in, let us know how you're doing today, and then type in the things that you're most grateful for, the top three things that you're most grateful for as you reflect on this morning. So we're going to get ready for Sunday School. We're in James chapter 3 today. James chapter 3. And we're going to let everybody get uh, checked in and then we'll be ready to go in our lesson. Let me start out. I'm feeling, um, I, I guess, energized. I need uh, to lay my fat head down, but I'm going to do that later on today. Get some rest. But I feel energized today. I was... I've been blessed last um, what, couple of weeks uh, to interact with some young people uh, first at, child, where was that? Is it somewhere out in uh, Pennsylvania? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ha uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, uh, did, uh, dealing with the uh, Disciple Makers Group. And then yesterday had an opportunity to uh, participate in a conference in Baltimore, Maryland. I just want to give a shout out to the Garden Church in Baltimore, Maryland. Great church, great church, great people doing a great work. And as a matter of fact, had a great uh, conference. And so I thank God for uh, what they're doing there and the, ch the churches that they're, tr they're planting in under-resourced uh, communities. So are we coming through all right? Can we see clearly? And can we hear well? Uh, I want my regular students just to uh, chime in right quick. Let me know before we get going. Uh, because I'm ready to go. James chapter 3 is where we're going to be. We are continuing on in our series about God's wisdom, skill in godly living. We walked through the book of Proverbs. And now here we are in the book of James. In James chapter 3, let's, all right, a little bit. Thank you, sweetheart. Love you so much. Everybody open up your Bibles to James chapter 3. All right. Now I see you. Come on in here, uh, children. Let me know how you're doing, what's going on w with you today. We're going to give others just another 30 seconds here to uh, type in how you're doing and what you're grateful for, and then we're going, we're going to go get it. <laughs> we're going to go get it, yeah. James chapter 3. Let's get set up here. James chapter 3, Watch Your Mouth is the title of our uh, talk today. We're just going to walk through the scripture. That's all we're doing. After you tell me how things have been going with you, let's see. There we go. All right. I believe everybody's... Uh, in their digital seats, checked in, all those types of things. So let me pray and then let's get at it. So great God, our Father, thank you for today. and Thank you for the beautiful weather. Thank you for friendship. Thank you for your grace as it's been extended to us this past week and your mercy that was even brand new this morning. Pray now that you would open our eyes as we open the book and show us wondrous things from thy, from thy law and help us to be not just hearers but doers of your word. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, James chapter 3. Let's see if we can't get at it. Let me frame this, um, frame our exchange today by just backing up a little bit and remembering 
uh, where we left off as we were in James chapter 2 dealing with the sin of, uh, of partiality, of uh, favoritism, of prejudice, and all those types of things. Now, he's picking up in chapter 3, and we're going to read, um, since it's short, we're going to read it in your hearing, and then we'll back up and sort of point out some things. But I want you, as I'm reading it, I want you to pay attention to all the different analogies or illustrations that James uses here. Now, remember, he's dealing with just the practicality of living in this fallen world. How can we live skillfully under God's, um, under God's authority as Christians? How can we, given that we're, we are broken, but in process, that is to say, that in Christ, we're brand new creatures, old things are passing away, new things are coming into being. We're in the sanctification process where we have been saved from the penalty of sin, but now God is saving us from sin's power in our life. He saved us from the slavery of sin, and the, pardon me, the sin of slavery, and now he's saving us from the slavery of sin, that is, He's gotten us out of Egypt, and now he's getting Egypt out of us. And in that process, we have to learn how to live skillfully. And one of the things that we have to master is our tongue. We used to sing a hymn. It's actually, I looked it up. It's hymn number 463 in the National Baptist Hymnal. <laughs> and it's, the title of the little hymn is, Oh, Be Careful. It's a little ch child children's hymn that grown-ups need to sing, and the third verse in the hymn is, Oh, be careful, little tongue, what you say. <laughs> oh, be careful, little tongue, what you say, because the Father up above is looking down below, so be careful, little tongue, what you say. How many relationships have been busted up because somebody wasn't watching their mouth? How many jobs have been lost because somebody wasn't paying attention to that little red piece of meat in their mouth. How many churches have been disrupted because somebody didn't know how to control their tongue? So today, let's work this thing out. And I want you, by the time we get done, to have some practical tools as it relates to watching your mouth. In chapter one, he dealt with our uh, how to deal with tests and trials and how we need to make sure we're not just hearing the word but doing the word because True religion shows up in how we act, particularly in how we deal with the widows and the orphans and all that type of thing. And then he moves into chapter two to point out in it that the real religion, true Christianity, authentic faith shows up in how we don't get caught up in favoritism, in prejudice, in looking at how people look on the outside as opposed to asking God to show you their heart. Now we're picking up in this piece in chapter 3. Let me read it to you. Let's see, what translation am I reading today? This is the ESV, um, and I'll look at the New American Standard as well. It says this, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so they will obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a force is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. 
With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessings and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it's earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Okay, come on in here, James. What you talking about? Let's see. Now, let's, let's just frame this thing. Do, do you see, if you were paying attention, he stacks on a whole bunch of analogies to try to get at the heart of the matter, which is you need to watch your mouth. Now, notice at the end, in verses 13 through, uh, what, 18, he's been talking about the tongue for like, what, 12 verses, but then he said, who is wise and understanding among you by his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. He's saying what I said earlier, that authentic faith is going to show up in how you behave. It's not enough to say, I believe, or I have faith, or I'm a Christian and this, that, and other, and you act in raggedy. You, I, I can't believe what you say because I see what you do. And what you do actually is revealing what what is in your heart. So he ends this piece after having talked about the tongue by reiterating kind of what he's been getting at in the first three chapters and that is if you are a real believer, if you are actually connected to the Lord Jesus Christ, then it ought to show up in how you act, how you handle your trials, how you deal with the less privileged, how you are not prejudiced in terms of just looking at the outside of people, how your Faith, remember he talked last week, we talked about faith without works is dead. How your faith is evidenced in your works. That works do not save you, but if you are saved, you're going to get to work. <laughs> if you are saved, it's going to show up some kind of way. And one of the ways it's going to show up is, can you, listen, can you control your tongue? Come on in here, Christians. Let's, let's get in this and let's see how he lays this out. Look at verse 1. He starts out by talking to everybody. I need everybody to chime in here to make sure that uh, you're, you're hearing me just so I can make sure that I'm coming through all right. I want you to type into the comment section, Lord, help me watch my mouth. Lord, help me. Watch my mouth because I can I can feel it in my spirit. Some of you, as I'm talking right now, you thinking about somebody else. Yeah, so and so show need to learn how to watch their mouth. Yeah, such and such, they need to hear it. No, I'm talking to you today. And I need you to type in, Lord help me to watch my mouth. Now, verse one, he says that not many of us should become teachers, knowing that we'll be held to a stricter Judgment. Now, that's a very interesting statement uh, to start out this little uh, train of thought that he's taking us on. Having just talked about faith and works and how your work gives evidence of your faith, just like it did with Abraham and Rahab. Now he's saying that as he's getting ready to talk about our, our conduct as it relates to speech, he's saying, OK, don't. This is very interesting. He says, not many of us should aspire to be teachers because we'll be held to strict, a stricter standard. We'll incur a stricter judgment, greater condemnation. What is he really getting at? That the, listen carefully, the extent of your platform, the size of your platform, the scope 
uh, that's the word I'm looking for. The scope of your influence, size of your platform, the opportunities you have is directly related to how strict the judgment will be for what you say. Why would that be the case? Because if you're a teacher or if you're a leader, you are influencing other people. And God always holds those who are influencing others to a stricter standard than the ones who are following. Why? Because if you're the authority in this situation and somebody, think about this, if you're the authority in a situation and somebody is following your lead, doing what you tell them to do, uh, you're the parent and your children are just doing what you teach them. You're the supervisor and your employers are just following your direct orders or you're the, you're the husband and your wife is uh, submitting to your leadership. You're the, you're the teacher and your students are just following what you say. Well, if they're wrong, yes, there will be some consequences and there will be some accountability. But the greater accountability will be to the one who told them to do that. They doing what you said do. It, there's a, a doctrine even in law called uh, agency. And agency 101 is that if, if you're my superior, if you're my uh, director, you're my boss, and you tell me to do something that turns out to be wrong, well, yeah, maybe I might face some consequences, but I can always say, wait a minute, hang on. I was doing what I was told. I was following directions. I was obeying the authority of my life. And then even the law said, well, yeah, you're right. Uh, you just doing what you were supposed to do. This joker right here, this is the one is going to be in trouble. And the Bible says that that applies even as it relates to talking. Now, he uses specifically teachers. Not many of us should be teachers because teachers will be held to a stricter standard. Teachers of the Bible, I say this all the time, bad teaching is worse than no teaching. That's why you need to study to show yourself approved under God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Because if you're teaching people the Bible, that's why I tell you every, every Sunday, and even now, look in your Bible. Don't just go by what I'm saying. Look, read, study for your doggone self. Why? Because if you're teaching people and you're teaching them wrong, it might take a lifetime for them to unravel bad teaching and to get the bad teaching out of them, their mind. Matter of fact, that's what makes pastoring so hard. I don't, it's not so much teaching, it's unteaching. I, I got to unteach a, a bunch of stuff so that you can believe the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ. So this doesn't just apply to teachers, this applies to all authority that the scope of your influence, the scope of your authority, the greater the scope, the greater the accountability. Why? Because if you're a blind guide, not only are you making folk fall in the ditch, but not only are you falling in the ditch, you're making other people fall in the ditch. You've seen these uh, pileups that they have very often. And be careful, children, that when the weather is changing like this, you know, in between seasons, sometimes there's fog. And uh, inevitably, there'll be some kind of big pileup. There'll be some kind of tragic situation where, you know, dozens and uh, dozens of cars right, might have an accident. Why? Because one following the other one and you speeding and, or you, and look up and now there's a, a, a chain reaction of crashes. How many lives have been impacted uh, because of bad teaching? And so just know that teachers have a stricter judgment. So we have to be careful about, about what we say, particularly if we have a platform. Now, let me make practical application. I'm not going to spend this much time on the rest of this, but this is extremely important. So what did I say? I said the scope of your influence, the scope of your impact, the arena, the platform, however big that is, that's going to be the measure of the accountability. So I need you to watch your mouth even online because if you have a big following 
on Instagram, on Facebook, on uh, X or Threads or Snapchat, whatever, TikTok, whatever your favorite platform is, and you're spreading misinformation, then you're going to be held. You say, well, uh, ain't nobody going to say nothing. Oh, yeah, God is watching. He, he watches over everything. I was reading that in my uh, devotion this morning that God uh, not only fashions our hearts, but he watches over uh, the hearts of man and his eyes are everywhere watching everything. So even though they might not uh, what tag you or uh, whatever it is, what do they do on uh, social media when you're acting a fool and they take you off of that thing? They might not, they might not censor you. Uh, they might not uh, tag you or, or whatever. Uh, but God is watching. My devotion this morning came from Psalm 33. And Psalm 33, verse 13 says this, The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of men. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all observes all their deeds. Yeah. Uh, the FA, I'm not FAA, the whoever is uh, 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 overseeing our online activity, they might not censor you, but God is watching. So be careful what you say, but be careful with what you type too. Don't just repost something and you haven't even, you haven't even looked to see, well, is this actually accurate? Because there's a lot of misinformation and a lot of disinformation. And you can be impacting people. Man, elections have been uh, flipped just by people not paying attention to where they were getting their information. Let's look at the rest of this. So what did he say here? James chapter three. That was just verse one. He says, look, we all nobody's perfect. In other words, is what he's saying in verse two. We all stumble in, in many ways. But if you. Uh. Don't stumble in what you say. You're a perfect man. Now, that word perfect there does not mean sinless. Literally, what he's saying is you're mature. The grown folk know how to watch their mouths. Listen, if you're still talking about, well, I, you know, I just got to say and you ain't got no filter, then you're still a child. Because grown people, if you know, you, we all stumble. Nobody's perfect. But if you don't stumble in what you say, then you're a, a, a perfect man, a grown man. And let me just say this, just in passing. We need more grown folk in church. I'm not talking about old folk. I'm talking about grown folk. We need more people who will put on their big boy underwear. Is that the way to say it? Their, their big girl underwear and come and help us fulfill the, the mission that God has had us. But... Too many times as pastors, we got to put out this fire and put out that fire. And where the fire coming from? From somebody talking too much. From somebody gossiping, from somebody saying something they ain't got no business saying. He can right say about he can right talk about that in just a second, that the tongue is a fire. But he said, listen, if you're mature, now he's already talked a little bit about this uh earlier, uh back in uh chapter one, that really mature Christians don't just hear the word, but they do it and they actually put it into action. He says here, if you can hold your mouth, you can take you can hold your whole body. Now, this is a startling statement. If you think about it, verse two says. If you're able to bridle, literally, it says, if you're able to bridle your tongue, you're able to bridle your whole body as well. Now, that's startling when you think about it. If you can control your tongue, you can control your whole body. Now, and then he makes his point. He said, well, just look at horses. A horse, any horse <laughs> known to man is stronger than any of the strongest men. But how will a horse let us control? How, if I was a horse, I would be telling humans, no, you drag me. I'm going to get on your back. I'm stronger than you. You, you uh, get connected to this buggy and you, you drive me. But that ain't what happened. What happened? We got horses. Matter of fact, we even got a term, horsepower, that is based on the fact that we figured out that if we can control that joker's tongue, we'll put uh, what they call bits 
in their mouth. You've seen the whole rig. They put bits and a bridle over the, the horse. This great big old horse that could kick you to death or stomp you. You ever seen him on the rodeo? You, the ho- he ain't got to let you ride him. And you, you know that because on the rodeo, they don't have that bit in his mouth. They just get on his back and the horse says, what? And be tossing him all around. But then they say, oh, no. He said, we, we got you. So you ain't going to toss me around. So what do they do? They put a bit in that joker's mouth. And then they can turn that whole great big old, <coughs> I don't know how much a horse weighs, but I know he weighs way more than a human. He can direct this big old half-ton horse whichever way he won't go. And got nerve enough to say, giddy up. <laughs> and the horse is giddy up. Why? Because if you can control the tender part, you can control the whole body. And what he's saying here, Christian, you want to grow up, you want to be grown, start right here. Watch your mouth. Because if you can control this part, you can control your whole body. And he gives another analogy, not just horses. Look at verse four. He said, look at ships. Big old, great big old ship. Ocean liner. Winds, tossing, waves, this, that, and other. But how can the pilot direct that ship. Now, if you look at a rudder compared to the size of a ship, as I say, I don't care how big the ship is. I don't care if it's an ocean liner or if it's a little rowboat. If you look at the actual mechanism that is directing the ship and compare it to the size of the ship, it's no comparison. It's not even, the, the rudder is not even 10% of the ship. But that small little rudder can direct a great big old ship. And what he's saying here is, look at verse 5. He says, here's my point. The tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. In other words, it can do it. <laughs> you ever heard this saying? This is what they used to say back uh, when I was growing up. Don't let your mouth write a check that your soul can't catch. That ain't what they would say. I'm we sanctify. So the idea was that your mouth can get you in trouble. It can get you out of trouble. It's that small little piece. And if you can learn how to control it, why do you need to control it? Because not only does it di- can it direct, listen carefully, children, not only can it direct your whole life, but according to the end of verse five and beginning of verse six, if you ain't watching it, you'll your tongue is like a fire. Uh, verse, the end of verse 5 says, See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. Every forest fire. Did y'all grow up with Smokey the Bear? He used to say, put out your little... Uh, what did Smokey used to say? Uh, Don't be smoking. <laughs> and put out little fires. Why, why would he say that? Because one little spark. This is very interesting if you pay attention to the uh, wildfires that happen out west every year. Or even, what, a couple of years ago, there was a tremendous fire uh, down in the, uh, down in Australia. And a few years ago, there was one in uh, Brazil, too, that was threatening the rainforest. And in every case, this fascinates me, in every case, when they do the investigation, and they're always going to do the investigation, it's a little something that has destroyed thousands of acres. It's one little boy who didn't put, who was playing with fireworks. It's one little camper that didn't put out the little, uh, the little campfire they had and look up, thousands of acres have now been destroyed because it don't take but a little. Children, let me say something, just uh, to cut across the field to get into some application. We read back in Proverbs Uh, several different places where it talked about cut off an argument before it gets started good. Don't keep running your mouth. I'm a I need to cut across the field here. Let's get to some practical application. Since you know that according to the Bible, verse 6, the tongue is a fire very world of iniquity set among the members is that which defiles the whole body, sets on fire the course of your life is set on fire fire by hell itself. Since you know all of that, why are you still talking? You see the argument is escalating. So why are you adding fire with your 
<laughs> little dragon breath. How are you not recognizing that a fire goes out when you don't add no more fuel to it? I'm talking about what's happening on your job. I'm talking about what's happening at the house. You uh, experiencing some static at the house. Why are you still talking? Watch your mouth. Let's get some practical application here because I'm going to finish the rest of this, but I feel the need to sort of press in that if we know the damage that can be done by our tongue, why are we not more careful to recognize in certain situations that, hey, if I say something now, I'm adding fuel to the fire. If, I just be, if I'm just silent right now, this fire might calm down because fire has to have fuel. And if it's burning, don't and you and you getting burnt, don't add more fuel to the fire. Be, take the take the fifth. Be quiet for a minute and let that thing die down. The way the proverb writer would say, a soft answer turneth away wrath, right? The grievous words stir up anger. As a churning of milk produces a produces butter as the twisting of the nose produces blood. So when you keep a conversation, when you keep on going back and forth, you're adding fuel to the fire. So here's what you need to do. Let's let, come here, Jesus. Thank you. Listen to me. Listen, if you're having some static with somebody, here's what Jesus would say from Luke chapter uh, six. We're going to come back to, to James. I just want to give you something practical so you can see why all this matters. Luke chapter uh, six, uh, Jesus, um, where, that part where uh, we love to talk about how uh, Jesus says, given it shall be given unto you. But read ab above that in verse 30, I want to say 35. But I'm looking in this uh, translation. I'm sorry, verse 27. That's what I thought. Verse 27, Luke chapter 6, verse 27 will help us right here. You're in a heated situation. You want to say something, but you know from reading the scripture that your tongue is like extra fire. If it's already smoldering, why would you want to put some fire on it? So here's something practical. Jesus says, love your enemies. Enemies doesn't have to be somebody way off. Doesn't have to be somebody that is just openly, openly trying to kill you. Enemy can somebody who, in that moment, has hostile feelings towards you. That could be somebody in the family. That could be somebody you work with. That can be somebody at the church. What do you need to do? Love your enemies is what Jesus says. Do get good to them that hate you. Bless them that curse you. And pray for those who abuse you or who spitefully uh, use you. The idea here is simply this, that sometimes the way you can put out a fire is instead of saying something, it's doing something. Jesus says, do good. They're, they're showing hate, hate towards you. So instead of talking something, just be nice. Do something. Be kind. Do something nice. Let your behavior, let your activity speak for you. Uh, find out what they need. Matter of fact, uh, Jesus said, uh, or Paul says it a different way, picking up on Proverbs. He says, if your enemy is hungry, give him something to eat. If they're thirsty, if they're thirsty give him something to drink. By doing so, you'll be, watch this. By doing so, you'll be heaping coals of fire on their head. Instead of blasting them with your tongue, kill them with kindness. Do good to them who hate you. But watch this. Jesus also says, bless them that curse you. Use your mouth instead of to tear the thing down, to blow the situation up. You can't talk to me like that. So I'm going to, you know, give you some of this fire in my belly. He said, no, no, no. Put some water on the fire. Bless them that curse you. That is to say, speak well of. They're, they're talking out the side of the net. You, you know what? I hear what you're saying. 
and, and I can understand how you would feel, how you'd feel that way. You know what you're doing? You not only bring the temperature down, but you're letting them know, okay, even though I don't agree with you, I respect you. I respect what you're saying. If you learn how to do that, you can turn some volatile situations into some more palatable situations. Jesus also says, don't just do good, don't just bless them, but pray for them. Have you ever, listen carefully, maybe before you talk to them, how about trying this? Why don't you talk to God to see what he says about the situation? You say, well, wait a minute, I'm in the heat of the situation. Yeah, that's what I mean. While you're in the heat of the moment, before you, say, well, I did no. You do know you can talk to God without bowing your head and uh, uh, folding your arms and whatever. You do know you can be looking at a joker and they just going off and you say, Lord, please. Now, I, uh, they are obviously incensed and I, Father, I stretch my hand. To, you, you can pray sit, and they don't even know you praying. You looking at them. <laughs> Steady praying. <laughs> I dare you to try. I dare you to, in the heat of the moment, figure out how to do good, how to meet their need, how to bless them with your understanding by repeating back to them, you know what, I understand what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. You don't even have to agree with it. You can say, I, I hear you to be saying thus and so, and, I, and I, I hear what you're saying, and you're not crazy. If I were you, I could understand why you would say that. You ain't agreeing with them. You're just respecting them enough to take the heat out of the thing. And if you can't do that, if they're just going off and they ain't even giving you a word edge ride, you, you want to say, I'll be that. And they just, they just going off. You ain't got to engage and you ain't got to wait. Because sometimes what we're doing is we're waiting for them to take a breath. So we said, well, wait a minute. Because they said something like, well, you never do this. And you didn't hear nothing else they said. You just wait. Well, well there was one time when I didn't. No, no, don't even do that. Just try to hear what they're saying. Be quick to, this is James chapter one. Be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to get angry. How do I do that? I pray while they talk. Lord, okay, I'm trying to understand. Help me understand what they're, help me understand what is actually going on here. What are they really trying to say? They're, say, they're doing too much right now, God. But what are they trying to communicate? Because the reason they're so heated is they feel like I'm not listening. So what are they trying to communicate to me, Lord? Help me to hold my tongue. I dare you to ask Jesus to help you to hold your tongue. He'll help you. Because you can't do it by yourself. Matter of fact, that's what the Bible says. Let's keep on reading this. I'm going to give you some more practical stuff here on the back end. He says, you can't do it by yourself. How do I know that? Look at verse 7 and 8. Every species of bird, wait, I'm sorry. Every species of beast, bird, reptile, sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed. He said, listen, we have done tamed everything but that little red piece of meat anchored to the bottom of your jaw with 32 teeth around it and two big lips. You still can't keep that thing under control. You need help because nobody, verse 8, are you reading in your Bible with me? Look at verse 8. He says, nobody can tame the tongue it's a restless evil and full of poison. So he's making the point and is sort of underneath the point, and that is you need help. We need the Holy Spirit to help us because the Holy Spirit, I'm going to talk, I'll be getting at that uh, here in John chapter 14 as we're uh, preaching through the upper room discourse. The Holy Spirit is our helper, and the Holy Spirit will help you not only to say the right thing, but learn how to be quiet when you need to be quiet and be silent in the face of uh, others uh, reviling you. He says, listen, make sure you understand something. I, I got I'm, Let me finish reading this so I can get to the practical application pieces. He said, listen, uh, with one tongue, we bless God and then we cuss people. He said, that ain't how that's supposed to work. How can blessing and cursing come out the same fountain? Out the same fountain, you ain't supposed to get fresh water and salt water coming out one one fountain. And as a matter of fact, a fig tree ain't supposed to produce olives. I'm looking at verse 12 now. Fig tree can't produce olives, and a vine, a grapevine, can't produce figs. 
nor can a fresh pond produce salt water. Now let's get at something here. What is up under this text? And that is, it, it seems like he's say, saying that we're helpless and that we're hopeless because you can't tame the tongue and it's the fire is going to tear stuff up. And uh, he points out the folly, the the foolishness, the the inconsistency that we show when we are talking about how how much we love God and he say here comes somebody to come in. Oh, there goes Sister Son. I can't stand her. Wait a minute. <laughs> how you you would just had your hair? Which is, no, no, that ain't how that's supposed to work. We got to get we got to get control of our tongues, and it starts with our hearts. Let's get to something practical uh, here as it relates to Jesus. Turn in your Bible. Let's see what Jesus has to say about this. Matthew chapter twelve. Lord Jesus, can you help us? Because we can't help ourselves. Uh, Matthew chapter twelve. Looking at. Let's just uh, pick up at verse uh, 33, and then I'm going to uh, point out something else here. Matthew chapter 12, starting with verse 33, Jesus says, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. He's talking to uh, uh, the Pharisees here. He says, You brood of vipers, how can you speak? Good when you are evil, here it is, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good. The evil person out of the evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified and by your words, you will be condemned. What is he saying there? He says, "Out of the here's the here's the clue he gives us that will help us, and that is this: out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks." So even though here in James the emphasis is on watching your mouth, the reality is the tongue can't be tamed. It's a world of fire. It. It, it is full of deadly poison. No man can tame it because left to our own human devices, we feel very comfortable blessing God and cursing people. But Jesus gives us a clue as to how to unravel that thing. It got to start with a new heart. Got to start with a clean heart. It has to start with letting the word, and here's, let's, let's get practical right here. It has, how, how do I change my heart so that I change my, uh, what comes out of my mouth? Because out of the abundance, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the, uh, out of the abundance of the heart, the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whatever in you is coming up out of you. Okay, well, how can I change what's coming up out of me? By changing what I put in me. <laughs> Thy word have I, y'all ain't read your Bible. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. That's Psalm 119, verse 11. Uh, Psalm 19, let's get that one. Let me give you some practical things now, and then we'll uh, be on our way. Psalm 19, after talking about all that the word can do, he, in Psalm 19, by pointing out in Psalm 19, uh, verse at 12, 13, and 14, he says, Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. What is he saying? Okay. The words of my mouth really reflect the meditation of my heart. So if I meditate on God's word, why? Because look at verse 7 of Psalm 19. This is why you got to have a regular, steady, consistent diet of God's word. Hearing, reading, studying, memorizing, and meditating on God's word. Why? Because the law, God's word, the law of the Lord is perfect. It revives the soul. 
The testimony of the Lord is sure. It makes wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, them, moreover by them your servant is warmed, warned, and in keeping them there's a great reward. The more of God's word you get in you, the more the overflow will come out of your mouth as opposed to, listen, it, it's, a, it's the displacement theory. It's not... It's not enough just to try to clean out your heart. You got to replace what's in it. And what's in it is what you meditate on the most. And so if you meditate, look, Paul, they still ain't getting it. Paul, you help me. Okay. What, here's what he would say uh, coming from Philippians. I want you to write these down. We're in application phase right now. I gave you Psalm 119.11. I gave you Psalm 19. I'm giving you uh, Philippians uh, chapter 4 now as it relates to okay I understand I can't tame my tongue by myself I need uh, the Holy Spirit and this Holy Spirit will help me as I put the right stuff in my heart because that's what's going to overflow from my mouth well how else can I do this look at Philippians chapter 4 Philippians chapter 4 verse 8 Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Whatever you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. See, you are responsible. Let me uh, let me say it this way. There's a I can't remember the name of the little shop. But when uh, Benny was going to school down in Dallas, we would go down there and there's a little yogurt shop, just like we have here. What do you call it? Yumberry and uh, uh, TCBY or whatever. You know, these little yogurt shops where you go in and you can pick whatever you want to put in your little cup. But there was a sign at this particular yogurt shop. It said, you are responsible for what you put in your cup. What they meant by that is you can't put nothing in the cup and say, well, I didn't want it. No, you put it in there, you got to pay for it. But what that means for you and I is I am responsible for what I put in my heart. If I'm watching junk, if I'm listening to things that denigrate other people, and if I'm uh, enjoying music that's calling women all kinds of nasty names and stuff like that, if I am reading things that are not edifying things. If I'm clicking on clickbait and getting caught up in Facebook wormholes about conspiracies, if I'm watching TikTok or Snapchat or Instagram and uh, just uh, gorging myself on images that are fake and unreal and setting up fantasies in my mind. If I'm doing all of that, all of that is in my heart and I'm responsible for what I put in my heart. However, since I know I'm responsible for what I put in my heart and that out of the abundance of my heart, that's what I'm going to speak about. I am responsible for what I put in. So I'm going to put in what, Paul? What's true? What's honorable, what's just, what's pure, what's lovely, what's commendable, what's excellent, what's worthy of praise, because I'm responsible for what I put in my cup. And I'm going to pay for. Jesus said it this way. You, uh, back in Matthew chapter 12, that scripture we read, he said, every word is going to be held into account. We read in James chapter 1, let not many of us be teachers because we'll be held to a stricter judgment. I'm going to be held accountable for what I put in my cup. That's all I'm trying to say. And so I need to make sure I have a healthy diet. Not And listen, I, I need to be careful to, to for you to understand what I'm saying. I'm saying, yes, we need to hear, read, study, memorize, meditate on God's word. I'm also saying that we need to delight in beautiful things. That we need to delight in, let your entertainment be that which is edifying and not defiling. 
Let the music you listen to. I'm not even saying that that the only music you can listen to is Shirley Caesar and uh, Kirk Franklin and you know. Some, no, you can listen to other music, but is it beautiful? Is it true? Is it uplifting? Is it encouraging? Do you come away with a with a, a sense of beauty, or do you come away with a sense of these? I won't. Even, I can't even repeat the words that some of the music, uh, popular music, is saying today about women. These so and so, blah blah blah, blah and you just bump it, just bump it, never thinking to okay, how is this impacting my heart and how it makes me view other people? You know, I'm a boss, a uh, uh, female dog. That's that's what they were saying in some of the uh, 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 what do you call them, the music awards and this like that. This and that. Well, number one, sister, you ain't a female dog. <laughs> Let's start right there. How about you a queen? How about you made in God's image? Do you understand what I'm saying? That I'm not just saying when you're reading the Bible or when you're in church that that God has given beauty in art, in just visual art, in just nature and all these types of things. How are you feeding your heart? Because whatever you feed your heart is going to come out of you some kind of way. And if you feed your heart with nasty stuff, guess what you're going to be talking about? Nasty stuff. If you like it, you 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 are either a bee or a buzzard. That's what my daddy used to say. A bee will fly, fly over a field and see all the nectar and will uh, go down in the flowers and all that kind of stuff and look up and the bee and made some honey. Buzzard fly over the same field, ain't even looking at now flower. <laughs> Don't see no nectar. A buzzard just looking for some dead stuff, looking for something that's rotten. As soon as he finds something rotten, he's going to swoop down and fill his belly with dead stuff. And that's why you see old stinking buzzard. <laughs> but then this little beautiful bee. Now, what are you, a bee or a buzzard? Whatever you fill yourself with, that's what you're going to come out with. And you are responsible for what you put in your cup. Let me see if I can't get one more lick in. All I'm trying to give you some practical things in terms of monitoring auditing, curating your intake. Not just your intake in terms of your body. Eat your colors, children. Drink more water. Okay, that's physical. But I'm talking about emotional. See, we want to feel better, but we won't, don't want to eat better. I'm not just talking about eating your colors and drinking water right now. I'm talking about what do you feed your mind? What do you feed your spirit? I can tell by how you talking You've been feeding on some rotten stuff. So change your diet. Because you're responsible for what you put in your cup. He says, let, let me see if I can. Uh, let me give you, well, one more lick here in terms of practical application. Now remember, we already talked about verses 13 through 18. But I want to finish up here, we talked in 13 and 18, he's talking about that your, you show you are living with godly skill by your conduct. And if you're bitter and jealous and full of selfish ambition and arrogant, all that kind of stuff, all of those things are heart matters. And you're showing what's in your heart. But true wisdom, the kind of wisdom, the kind of skill and godly living that comes down from God is not demonic, it's not natural. Uh, but is pure, verse 17, pure, peaceable, gentle, reasonable. That is, it, it's easily entreated. It will be humble enough to listen, full of mercy, good fruits, and without hypocrisy. You can choose what's in your cup. You can choose either pure, peaceable, gentle, reasonable, merciful, uh, without hypocrisy, or you can choose bitter, jealousy, selfish, arrogant, blind. The choice is yours. But either way, it's going to come out. You can't hide it. Because what's in your heart is going to come out your mouth. So here's what I want you to do. Two or three things. Number one, we've given you Psalm 119, verse 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Get into the discipline of memorizing scripture. Even if you just memorize one verse per week, a piece of verse per week, that you meditate on it because that will clean out your heart. That's what Psalm 19 says, that the law of the Lord restores the soul. It, it 
fills in those empty spots. It crowds out all of the negative things and pray along with Psalm 19, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable unto you, uh, Lord, my rock, my redeemer. Number three, I've given you song, uh, pardon me, Luke chapter six, verse 27, that in the heat of the moment, things aren't going that well at the house, on the job, in your interaction with your siblings or somebody at the church or whatever. Do you have, to, has talking been working? Let me, let me say this. Had what you've been doing working? Has that been working? If it ain't been working, why are you still talking? Be quiet. If, if you know that they have animosity toward you in this moment, it, even people who love you can be, has, have animosity toward you in the moment. So in, you, you can't talk your way out of some stuff. Some stuff, Jesus said, you got to love your way out. How do I do that, Jesus? Well, I do good to them who hate me. They don't hate me all the time. They just hate me right now. So I'm going to be good. I'm going to let my actions speak for me. Do good to them that hate you. If I am going to speak, I'm going to bless them that curse me. One good way you can bless somebody is letting them know that I hear. I hear you. I hear what you're saying. Or just being nice. Or, you know what? I appreciate how you did this and so. Or, man, that was nice what you did for me. Yeah, the, the whole conversation doesn't have to always be about what you're in contention about. Talk about some other stuff and be commendable. I'm not talking about being manipulative. I'm just talking about, can, Christian, can you be nice? Just can you be kind for just a minute? Bless them to curse you. And whatever you do, pray for them that despitefully use you. That's how you express, that's how you love your enemies, according to Luke chapter 6, verse 27. I gave, did I give you another one? I gave you, uh, if I didn't, let's end uh, right here. Yeah, I did give you uh, Philippians chapter 4. That you are responsible for what you put in your cup. So filter, curate, audit your entertainment, the music that you listen to, you know, the things that you fantasize about, what you're clicking on and devouring in your social media. Number one, is it true? I started out talking about misinformation and how much stuff, disinformation. Don't be just uh, uh, forwarding or sharing something on digital media and you ain't even checked out if it's true. Uh, is it true? Is it honorable? Is it just? Is it pure? Is it lovely? Is it, is it a good report? Is it excellent? Is it praiseworthy? If, it's, if it fits into that, then meditate on that. That's not just scripture. That's art. That's entertainment. That's the music you listen to. I was listening to, uh, what's this boy? Corey Henry. He's a jazz organist. Well, actually, church too. Great little uh, new album and I was just listening. It's not a church CD per se even though it has some churchy stuff on it but it edified my soul. I love to listen to jazz. I listened to some opera. Got into that while I was in the pandemic. You see what I'm saying? Well is it scripture? No but it's beautiful it's true. It's honorable and it's not making me go around singing about uh, women as uh, female dogs and this that and nothing. Just because it got a good beat don't mean you should let that get in your heart. Because it's affecting you and it's going to ultimately come out of your mouth. And so you wonder, you didn't say something to somebody, you so and so, so and so. You say, where did that come from? I don't remember pastor preaching that. No, you got that from, <laughs> you got that from whoever you listening to on the radio. So change your diet, you'll change your heart. Change your heart, you'll be able to watch your mouth. I got to let you go, children. I got to get ready for church, and so do you. Uh, go ahead and finish getting ready. Get out to the place of worship today. Looking forward to a great day of worship here. We'll be having our legacy brunch after church, celebrating our seniors. In the meantime, do me a favor, and as these, um, as the seasons change, take care of yourself. Make sure you're eating your colors. Make sure you're drinking uh, plenty of water and moving your body, and then getting the appropriate amount of rest. Remember, those of you who are New Zion members and Grace Fellowship, if you're joining along with us, remember we're fasting on Fridays, absolute fast, up till 6 o'clock p.m. 
And then we're doing a digital media fast from 8 p.m. Friday to 8 a.m. on Sunday. If you do that, you'll sort of clean out your heart and you'll be in tune. God bless you. I love you. God loves you most. And we'll see you later.